Tim, we are back with another episode. Today we're talking getting stronger. So I guess the biggest question is how do we do that? Top of the list, we have to define getting stronger. I think there's a, a very loose definition out there. And sometimes it's, I think it's a harsh term, but it's bastardized in a way, right? This idea of getting stronger is this like junk term that is a synonymous with doing a other TRX inverted row or a BOSU ball push up, or even on the other end of the spectrum, back squatting 700 pounds. Like there's, there's these wild continuums that have created with this term getting stronger, you know, being strong is a, is almost a metaphor in a lot of ways as well. Like emotionally, physically, cognitively, spiritually, all this stuff is associated with that, that, that reference of strong or stronger, which I think we need to kind of like, for the sake of, of talking about this, frame this, categorize this and go through what is actual strength. So it goes from the, the root of force, right? This, this mass times acceleration from physics, if we want to get to what is absolutely true here, right? If we don't know where to start, just go back to what we know to be true. Founding first principles of physics and anything else, but force times mass times force is mass times acceleration, right? So mass is something with weight or density, and then acceleration is from zero velocity upwards and how fast can we move it? So we're thinking there's two ends of that spectrum, right? And when we think about uh, force and we look at this idea of, okay, well, I'm moving something, it has some sort of weight, and then I'm moving at a certain rate. Well, what's going to have a bigger impact on the greater good? And then you look at the mass aspect. And where a strength and conditioning coach might get pretty locked in on is heavy objects moved at a certain speed. Others might be moving your body weight at a certain speed. And they're both kind of accurate. But it gets into the what is the, what is the, the premise or what's the outcome we want from getting stronger? And there's a lot of, I guess, loose correlations out there. Like a lot of times we can get stronger and be more efficient and become faster, right? That's a very, very logical sequence for a traditional strength and conditioning coach. Like if when in doubt, there's a missing link here and it's the ability to produce force, okay, get them stronger. When in doubt, they have deficiency in bo lean body mass. Okay, well, get them stronger, right? There's this association with this stuff and it's all kind of true on some sort of, spectrum and it's more true in certain situations than others but the truth is it just it makes the whole thing confusing and and hard to track and triangulate but when we're breaking it down i want to think about there's like pretty much going to be a couple forms of strength one being relative strength and that's your strength relative to your body mass so if i weigh 200 pounds and i could squat 400 pounds I can squat two times my body mass, or I weigh 200 pounds and I could do 10 pull-ups. I can move my 200 pound body 10 times in a pull-up. On the other one is absolute strength. That is the detached from your body mass. So we're at a powerlifting meet and it doesn't matter if I weigh 200 pounds, 100 pounds, or 300 pounds, the person who can lift the most weight has the highest absolute strength. And then the other part is, okay, well that person who's 300 pounds, 200 pounds, 100 pounds is asked to do a pull-up their absolute load on there. So the person that can do a pull up at 300 pounds has a higher absolute strength than a person who can only do one pull up at 100 pounds. And regardless of what the body mass is there, they're doing they're moving 300 pounds versus 100 pounds. Those are two really important things to think about when we're going through that. And there's some other classifications if you look through some of the sports science literature of starting strength, speed strength. These are all going to be components you'll find as you unpack strength. But for our sake and talking to everybody out there, we want to think about this in two different parallels. And when we're talking to a personal trainer or physical therapist, a strength coach, they might be thinking strength is absolute strength. And then you might be thinking about it from a relative strength standpoint off of, I was told I should do body weight exercises or calisthenics or, or be able to control my body weight in space. And we just need to get clear on what we're defining as strength here. And I think that's a really good start part. part. So just backtracking from this. Force, that's the central piece of getting stronger. Can I produce more force? Two different types of strength, relative strength and absolute strength. Relative strength being relative body weight, absolute strength being regardless of body weight, what is the absolute load on the bar or whatever the external load is. And then we can kind of move into how do we get stronger, which hopefully frames the next series of questions. 
no uh, before we get into that specifically, I want to unpack like because there's these different categories: right? relative strength, absolute strength, starting strength, speed strength. It, you kind of laid it out a little bit, and like it's important to have the nomenclature correctly, so we're all talking the same language. But why do the categories matter? Or I guess put put another way, it's would certain qualities be more important for different populations? Mm. Yeah. So it depends, right? It's always it depends, and that's a mm -hmm. Pretty shitty answer, which Pop I apologize. Out. It is. It's a. It's lazy. It's. Uh -huh. It is, and it's what like the, you know, when when you, if you're ever familiar with the term the Dunning Kruger effect of the more you know, the less you think you actually know. That's a. It's just a cop out. So I definitely think it has. It depends, but there is specific situations. I'm not just. Every single time I get a client that has a goal of losing body fat or gaining muscle, just going, well, I guess it's all kind of some sort of shade of gray and it doesn't really matter what we do. No, I have a plan and I have an idea of what I need to do. And I like to think about it. I start in the middle and start to work in various directions, not necessarily based off of what I think you need, but how are you going to respond to what I think you need? And there's a point, there's an important criteria in that. So if you start to present to me, I want to improve my body composition, relative strength matters way more than absolute strength. Yep. And uh, let me unpack that because I think it's important because the, I think one of the primary issues with strength conditioning coaches and this developing a myopic level focus on absolute load. And we get preoccupied with certain exercises like back, back squats and bench, as opposed to what is a relative strength. It starts to lead in this vector of there's an easy way to increase absolute strength. just to change your center of mass, change the biomechanics, create more momentum. And then you start seeing techniques that we utilize in powerlifting, which is absolute strength focused. That is not congruent with improving body comp. In fact, if you go look at a powerlifting meet, you probably argue that those people have the worst body comps. And if I have a client that wants to improve their body comp, and I'm looking at this from an absolute strength perspective, and I'm being detached from what's really going to make a, a change here is relative strength, because that's synonymous with increased less muscle mass and decreased fat mass. Because what we think about relative strength, you're more efficient. Bottom line. And when I'm thinking about efficiency from a functional life, from a, a level of aesthetic, from having more muscle and less body fat, is the more external load you can move relative to one's body weight, the more congruent that is to a body compositional goal, right? And when we start to break down this bigger picture of, hey, I want to improve my lean, my lean body mass, I want to decrease my fat mass, and I start to say, okay, there's a probably a, a greater semblance of relative strength is going to have a bigger impact here, but it actually might come at, they're just weak. They're very weak. And it could have this kind of, well, this looks a lot like absolute strength. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get as ruthlessly strong as possible to raise a ceiling here so I can have a better reserve because my relative strength is already like here. So I just need to improve their absolute strength so I can pull that reserve a little bit higher. But in the other note, if I have an absolute strength athlete and like, I got to get another five pounds on the bar to set a world record. Relative strength is important, but it's not really the end all be all. Yeah. I could argue that if I improve their body comp, if I add a little more lean muscle mass, that's all good, but it actually might come at the expense of spending more time on technical aspects to get more absolute load. And I'm not trying to improve technique for someone to get, I should say, I'm not trying to improve technique to get more absolute load for someone who's trying to improve body comp, but I might do that for someone who's trying to get more absolute load or compete in some way. And that, that criteria is important. So yes, it, again, back to the original premise, it depends, but it depends on the goal and it depends on what you respond to and what you need. And if I was to sit there and say, oh, well, relative strength is the only thing that matters and you should just do body weight oriented exercise the rest of your life, like you're going to look weird. Right. And this is the, this is where I get so frustrated with this notion that it's a very simple distilled down answer. And I'm not trying to create artificially create a uh, value. Like, I think that's the problem. Like when you, you hear me bitch and gripe and complain about other, what I call compilers of talking about, just do these three things or just do this and you're going to be fine. Like just reduction is based thinking at its finest. And I've, I've explored all the research and I'd be able to compile it down. Like, no, you haven't. You're not artificial intelligence. You're a liar and you have agenda and you have a bias. There's no way you can do that. But in the other no, when you get to that situation and it's a complex situation at all times and you present to me this and I look through your whole training and history and I look at all the things that are going to be of value to you and I start to create this vector that we're going to go off of, it's just an educated guess. 
And with my 20 years plus of experience and the thousands of success stories that I've had <clears throat> and then be able to compete with the best in all domains of improving body comp, improving speed, improving just absolute strength, com competing and weightlifting, all the things, I will sit there and tell you with great confidence, there's no simple distilled down answer. Just focus on relative strength or just focus on absolute strength. And that's where I think it becomes problematic. And a lot of people are going to go, oh, I'm just going to cherry pick. Tim said to do this, or this person said to do that. Don't, don't. It's, like this, it's a mistake. It's a common, it's a common novice mistake to just latch on to things that you think are true because it probably fits a narrative that you want to do, right? It's easy to get strong if all you do is a single or a double every three minutes for 60 minutes. Right. If your body composition sucks and you're trying to compete in a lower weight class, that is really hard on a lot of people that just like to get strong. You know, and if you look at the habits, the lifestyle, like mass moves mass, go to a powerlifting meet. It's like, have you ever seen the movie Kingpin where they go to the bowling championships and, and Lloyd goes, I so, and it's so intimidating to be around all these elite level athletes and they're smoking cigarettes and, and crushing beers and having pizza. That's like a powerlifting meet. Yeah. Cause mass moves mass. Mm -hmm. The more body mass are like sumo wrestlers and strength sports. Same thing in strongman. You see a lot of barrel chested, a lot of big, huge bellies from diaphragmatic Valsalva maneuver type of setups. You'll see a lot of gear like, Hey, weight belts, like a triple ply suit, knee sleeves, elbow sleeves do you think any of those assistant tools are designed to improve your lean body mass and improve the way you look no they're improved they're focused on increasing whatever capacity to handle external load so you can have higher absolute load and that notion that oh you just get them stronger that's misguided and limited hey just focus on relative strength as well right where we see a bunch of people are just doing calisthenics and flow and movement that couldn't lift their way out of a wet paper bag like they're just weak as puppy piss and they're going to get exposed in some way, shape or form from, or they don't have enough capacity to handle external load. So the reserve is so there. The ceiling is so down. Yeah. They might be able to move their body weight through space and compete in American Ninja Warrior, but I wouldn't say that they're necessarily the, the premier aesthetic. And I don't know if they're necessarily healthier. They just have this superiority complex of they've put a lot of time and effort into, all right, hey, this was hard to get. No, no doubting it. Like watch anyone put 200 kilos over their head and snatch. That wasn't easy to get, but not necessarily what everyone wants. And I think that process of confusing hard work, dedication, and applying yourself as, you know, the answer or the end all be all. I don't know if that's necessarily the, the best course of action. So going back to the original point of relative strength, absolute strength, even like something as simple as like, oh, the person's slow, just work on speed strength. Like, Sure, you know, Occam's razor, this of like the most simple logical solution might be the best one, but it also might not necessarily be what that person needs right there in that moment, right? And that, that's the part that's so hard to evaluate. And my, the, the simple answer is get a pro and get someone who has a great perspective and understanding of what is relative, relatively needed, I guess, pun intended there, and go from there. Okay, so someone comes to URI, they're signed up, they're ready to go, they're, they're bought in. What are we focusing on from week to week, month to month? Getting stronger. And that's, again, the original term. What is getting stronger? It's, you know, the, the, I hate to get back to it, but what's an indicator of getting stronger? It's progressive overload. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about this in all of our courses and all of our, all of our resources, but there's three ways to assess getting stronger. It's either you're going up in intensity, so I'm adding weight. I'm adding volume in some way, shape, or form. And that can come in the form of adding sets, adding reps, or adding time and retention. So a longer actual rep and aggregating out to a longer set. And then there's more dense. And I can do the I can do more work in the same time, or I can do the same work in less time. But either way, I have some sort of criteria. Here I was week one, and here I am week two. A lot of times we're getting stronger, it's gonna be focused on intensity. Right. And that's that's good. That's not a bad thing. Cause it's easy to associate getting stronger. And I think that's important. It's also a great litmus to assess the amount of volume, the amount of intensity, the amount of rest that you had. And one of the things that I think is so pure and simple about progressive overload, it's, it's a black and white picture of your planning and your execution. And if you have good hypothesis of training and you have great execution, in theory, you should go up every week until you go on to a new program. 
And if you can't, you got to question whether it was the great execution that we hoped it was. And if that's the foundation of the premise of your training. If we can't evaluate execution, then we have no idea whether the premise of training was that good or not. But if we have good execution, then we have to go back to, okay, it was bad planning. Whether it was too much volume or intensity, not enough rest or not enough, or too little or too much frequency. And you really don't know until afterwards an output measurement, right? So if I can go up every single week, I did a great job. If I can't, I got to start to question whether I did a good job or not, or I executed pro properly. And that simple trigger, that's the probably best way. And it's whether it's, that's universal to, it's a principle. So it has to be true with our context. So if I can go up, whether it's absolute strength focus or relative strength focus or starting strength or speed strength, whatever I'm focusing on, even if it's more volume based or hypertrophy or muscular endurance or capacity, it's the same principle. It's, can I go up? Am I making progress? And I could appraise whether I did a good job, both execution and from the actual premise of training. So what are you, or like, what kind of questions are you asking specifically? Like, okay, I, I couldn't go up like three weeks in a row, whatever it is. is. Does it come back on you? Do we dive deeper into the individual? How do you attack that? I mean, well, I mean, shame is probably the best motivator. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it's multivariate. It always is. And mm -hmm. I think it's when you have to have a conversation about their lifestyle and all the things that go into it. One of the things that is so apparent is you have about three to four hours a week with a client or an athlete. And there's a lot of other hours in that week that can override whatever things that you're doing within the weight room where the best programs are considerate of that. And the right. best programs are malleable to that person's environment and lifestyle. And in truth, I think this is the part that I find so compelling and why it's so important as a strength coach or trainer to become immersed in the history of physical culture and strength conditioning and performance through exercise or any other mode of, of thing. It's a lot of people who competed in the Olympics before 1970 were working manual labor jobs. Yep. And whether they're running a hundred meter sprint, throwing a shot put or competing in weightlifting, they were probably doing some sort of construction and probably taking some sort of, of wage from outside because they're quote unquote amateurs and still doing tremendous feats within, within this competitive arena. And you look at Tommy Kono's programs, or you look at some of the old York barbell programs, or you look at, you know, even some of the old bodybuilding programs, a lot of these males and females that reached incredible levels of strength and performance, were doing it on a three day total body program. And as we start to look back and we evolve, you know, there's been a lot of insertions of, of, oh, you can do a six day program or you can do a four day upper lower program. Or I heard this is the best way to get stronger. That might be coming at a certain level of omission of normal life and the organic nature of, of just not sleeping a whole lot, not eating a whole lot, not being hydrated a whole lot, and then coming into the weight room and, all right, you know, now I got to go up in whatever I did last week. That's the problem where we detach. And a good program based off of tracking and wellness and RPE and looking at all the metrics we can possibly can, can compile that into, all right, this might be a really shitty day and we need to maybe adjust so we can go up next week. Or it might be all right, you got to rise and overcome because you have to learn. You have to get take care of your stuff before you come here. And there's always a teachable moment and there's always a point of empathy. There's always a point of, of compromise. And there's always a point to go, all right, my job here is to push you when you don't want to do something. And a coach, where's that hat? Well, you doing that for yourself. And this is for true for strength coaches trying to do their own programming. It's you don't wear that hat well when you have to give yourself the accountability or the empathy that you personally need. And I think that's the process of you can't just cherry pick certain things off the Internet because it doesn't really take in consideration all the beautiful and, and interesting things that make you you and your life unique and nuanced. And getting stronger is the goal, whether it's relative strength, absolute strength. Going up every week is a mechanism to prove that. But the problem will be is if we have no, no intersection with how to manage that program with your life, 
It's going to be a shitty program no matter what. And that process, I find, is the, the dynamic that we have to play out. So back to your original question, Corey, great to meet you. You want to get stronger. You want to focus on relative strength. Let's say it's body compositional focus. Here's our 12-week plan. We're going to do three, four, three, four-week training blocks going up every week for four weeks, starting a new program every fifth week. What we're going to do between then, each, each training block is evaluate a good start point, maybe leaving some reps in reserve and starting to shave away at that, maybe having an intensity, or maybe just saying, here's our goal today is to move a bar between this bar speed, or we're just going to do it a certain intensity, like a what we call APRE or a, C, a perceived rate of exertion and say on a scale of one to 10, I want that I be a four. And that basically means you don't have a whole lot of intensity per that set. And that's okay. But as we get closer to week four, it's going to be a 10, whatever mechanism that you can go. All right. Like I understand the assignment and I'm going to train really hard with great execution within the parameters that were set for me. And I'm going to go up every week. And then we get to whatever performance week it is. We have a good inventory of what your lifestyle is like. Are you asleep? Are you recovered? How do you feel on this day? Do you feel like you're adequately prepared? And then I have to make a decision. Hey, we're going to commit to this plan. We're going to set up PR today, or we're going to push for an absolute highest load within this four-week training block. Or I have to make a split-second decision going, he doesn't got it. This isn't worth it. The risk-reward ratio is now off, and it's going to set us back recovery-wise for the weeks to come. But it might mean the next week, we have a hard conversation about taking care of your shit and coming in next week ready to work so we can optimize that next training block. And that's where good training is. It's adaptive. It's organic. It has a plan. It has an objective. It has a vector. But it also has a realization that people are going to come in with their own set of things that you need to be able to adjust. And the plan still moving forward. It's just taking a slight detour, but getting us into that direction, right? And we took a, we had to take a path based off, all right, we're just... We tripped our ankle up and we need to now find a better plan for today. But it's still moving to our true north of getting stronger. And that's based, on, again, off of progressive overload. Kind of hit on it there, which was going to be my next question, was like, how do we sort of set up a program so that we can build that momentum? You know, you, you can use velocity-based training, reps in reserve, APRE. Um, so just something to consider for the listeners out there is like, hey, a good program is going to take these things into mind and help you build that success over time. So that by the time, by the time you get to week four, week six, week eight, whatever that, you know, perform week is for, for you, you're ready to push, assuming you handle all your stuff on the back end. So, you know, what's pointed out, I think is really cool. There's another principle, point of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. It has to be true, right? At a certain point, what we do is no longer effective, right? This is the premise behind a training block length or mesocycle length. Right? How long can we continuously load until it's no longer effective? It's true for this idea of upper amount of volume or intensity we can hit in a training session. Right? So if I'm going to do 10 sets of 10, at a certain point, that is no longer tolerable. Right? And if you're not familiar with intensity and how hard that would be, imagine running a 100-meter sprint at 11 seconds and trying to do that 10 times with a minute break. You just, you're going to break. Or if you've more accustomed to distance, like running a five minute mile, 10 times for, for, with a three minute break, like whatever the, whatever that association with is, but it's not really, it's designed to not be finished, right? right. This, all right, here's our, almost our conditioning test or our, or what sometimes we joke about this idea of what is the human limit or the human condition. All right. And we had a whole joke about the, there was a Russian fable about a person in a ice box car and they get to the end of the line and they die and they realize the ice wasn't turned on and the person just thought it was cold you know that thing of like whatever the mental conditioning you need for that and but if you're looking at it from that there's going to be a point of diminishing returns you could hit it set six set seven whatever and when we look at that end of the spectrum sometimes we'll do a super compensation block where we can go hey we're going to train twice a day for five days in a row and we know that Day three and four are going to be really bad, and day five is going to be even worse. That's kind of the premise of that. Is we're not going to be able to train for an extended period of time, so we have to comp we have to load up everything we do on a given week, and we know that we're just going to hit a point of diminishing return. But the point being is when we look at that diminishing return, you have to have a contingency at that moment. You have to find an amendment to the plan that you know is still going to get you onto that upward track. And there's three there's three triggers that you can start to look at when you hit that point of diminishing return. And for context, you want to think a good rule of thumb is about 90% of whatever the value you're trying to do. So if you're hitting a set of 10 and you can't hit nine reps, you have to either, you have to find another plan. 
And that hopefully that makes sense. If you're trying to run a hundred meter in 10 seconds and you run in 11, you have to find another plan. And the three things that you could do based off of not hitting 90% of what you plan to do are go down in weight or lower the intensity, right? So now I'm going to do 12 second, hundred meters, or I'm going to do a lot, a 10 pound lighter squat. You can get more rest, right? So now I'm resting every minute. Now I'm going to add another minute of rest. I'm going to go to two minutes rest. And the final one is just stopping altogether. And they're all right. Just depends on what the context provides for itself. So if you're working in a team environment, telling someone to stop is not very, very productive because the rest of the group is still going. And that group, that person has stopped because they couldn't hit a certain weight feels like they are alienated or singled out. Better to use more rest or lowering intensity. In a one-on-one -on -one environment, and I know you intimately, and I know you give everything you got because I've been working with you for six months and say you just don't have it, I make an amendment and stop and move on to something else. And that's the thing that you have to toggle between. And what I would come back to before of humans are not really conditioned to make those decisions for themselves. They're just not. Uh, they either they're going to feel like crap and do something they shouldn't do, or they're going to stop whenever it's inconvenient or just slightly hard. And that part is, yeah, the, the part why it's so invaluable to have a coach, especially if you're trying to get stronger. And that part is there. So going back to the original point of, hey, track APRE or track bar speed or track reps in reserve or utilize intensity, use a relative intensity, whatever it is. But when that APRE, reps in reserve, bar speed or relative intensity is no longer what we want and we hit this point of diminishing returns, your contingencies are what makes the difference to getting you towards that point B. And if you don't have contingencies in place and you have a plan to have – for when something's not going the way we want, because the whole point of this is to be able to be malleable to that environment based off of what we ultimately want to accomplish, you're not going to make it. You're not. And this is where I'd come back to the original point of my goal is to get you absolutely strong. My goal is to get you relatively strong. We have a premise behind that, right? I want to improve your body comp, so I'm going to get you relatively strong. Or, hey, I'm competing in powerlifting, and I want to get absolutely strong. Okay, well, on the other end of it, if I'm good at my job, I'm pushing you to that brink every single day and i know what the limit is and i know when i reach that limit what it doesn't what i don't want it to look like and i know what my plan is on the other end of that because i'm always thinking about i'm not gonna i'm not gonna walk a conservative route here you have an expectation of me to push you to your absolute limit because you want to get stronger for whatever reason and when i get to that point and a good coach, a smart coach, someone that understands that their value is not necessarily just pushing, 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 but is having a good contingency when they can't push anymore. That's when the real value comes in. And I could put my coaching hat on. I could turn around like Lincoln Hawk and say, okay, it's go time. It's time to get this going. Or on the other end, I can start to look at this from the premise of it's time to back off. And it's time to look at it from the, the other way of this person just doesn't have it. And I know what their real intention is. And I'm just going to be the, the voice of reason here and hopefully have a have a day that we can move on and get another great training day the next time. And that's that's where the real secret is on all this. It's everyone could just throw sets, reps, and intensity on a sheet of paper, and everyone could say, work harder, but no one really can handle when we can't work any harder, and no one can get us to a goal when we hit that that inevitable intersection of life and strength. Yeah, that was awesome, Tim. I think next week we're talking specific protocols, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Damn right. Really good. So, yeah, I, I, I just want to say you got pretty riled up there. So I didn't, didn't mean to uh, put you on the hot seat. <laughs> no, it's good, man. It's good. I it's, love it's that. Great, though. You were, that's you were it, rolling. Man. That's, that's it. I have definitely not hit my diminishing returns on these. No, so definitely not. Hope you guys are. Yeah. I have no need for contingency here. Yeah. We're just rolling. <laughs> we're at hashtag grinding all day. That's it, man. That's it. Living off the eans. Caffeine, caffeine, nicotine, and protein. That's it. That's all we need. That's it. See you, Tim.